Common Table, week two of I Advent. Knew it. Second Sunday of Advent. Second We're almost week there. of Advent. Santa's coming to town. We're almost there. So we're talking about the promises of Christmas. Um, last week we talked about the promise of hope. I had to think for a second. <laughs> <laughs> we hope you can remember. <laughs> hope I can, yeah, I hope I can keep this together. I think it was hope last week. I hope it was hope last week. It was hope last week. We had a good conversation. Um, we're going to talk about the promise of love this week and what that means with regard to Christmas. Mm -hmm. But just to kind of ease us in to talking and getting to know each other more. What is your favorite Christmas tradition? Favorite Christmas tradition? I love going to the church on Christmas Eve and uh, the service there and then lighting the candles and, mm -hmm. you know, and then they dim the lights. It's always been one of my favorites. Mm -hmm. I think I like um, the home things. You know, my life's been real public. Mm -hmm. And back in the day, we did, one year we did 22 Christmas concerts in 19 days. Ooh. And that was all the way to California and back. And it was an insane year. So I really have learned to treasure the home stuff. Yeah. And when I was growing up, we did Christmas Eve at <coughs> home because we didn't have a service when Dad was preaching. Yeah. Um, and so we would read the story, the Christmas story from Luke 2. And Dad had this little miniature um, communion set that all preachers have. Do you have one of those, Charlie? No, not yet. For doing hope. Well, we got to get you one of those. You need a robe. You need some stoles from around the world. I have a robe. And you need a miniature communion set. So we had that, and we would have communion as a family. And my little brothers would argue over who got to take up the offering because, you know, Methodists always have to take up the offering. <laughs> turn, in your t turn in your allowance, kids. That's right. That's right. <laughs> I'm taxing the money I've been giving you out of my own money. But when I got to be a mom, we kind of we kind of carried that on. But of course, I was a worship leader in a church too, so we had to um, do the church thing two or three mm -hmm. times on, on a Christmas Eve. But then we would, at home, let the boys tell the Christmas story using the little nativity scene. And it's just been real special to have those times at home around the, around the fireplace. If I did that many concerts one year, I'd never want to leave again either. <laughs> <laughs> I'd be like, I'm staying home for a year. Yeah, that's right. Uh, for sure. Uh, mine would probably be so my mom's family would always either meet the weekend before or the weekend after Christmas, just kind of where it fell. Mm -hmm. We didn't do like tons of like same thing every single year other than just like open presents, spend time to each other, play board games afterwards. Usually like bananagrams, which is bad because I can't spell. <laughs> so like, I'm to. just sitting there looking at a bunch of like three letter words like these don't go together. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not good at this. <laughs> I'm like overly competitive about it. I'm just kind of like, eh. I'm going to take a pass on this one. <laughs> um, yeah, it's funny. Like f for a long time before I became a pastor, I'm like, I want to be a pastor. And you don't always think through the consequences of decisions. You're, you know what I mean? Like you, yeah. I want to for all these reasons. And then there's all these unintended things. Like pastors always work on Christmas Eve. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like, wait a minute. I have to work on Christmas Eve because we have Christmas Eve service. Um, so growing up, my entire family was in Jackson. So we did kind of like the meal here, meal here, meal here, meal mm -hmm. here. Now we're scattered everywhere. So that kind of tradition has kind of fallen by the wayside. But yeah. when I became a pastor, Christmas Eve service became a thing, but it also took on like a whole new meaning. Like when I was growing up or when I was in college or even a young family, it's like, okay, you go to church on Christmas Eve, no big deal. Mm -hmm. But the first Christmas Eve that I pastored the service, I was like, whoa, I'm responsible for their Christmas Eve experience? This is scary. <laughs> like, <laughs> like I, didn't ca I, didn't, I didn't factor this in on being a pastor. Like, you do church mm -hmm. on Sunday, and I get it. I'm like, this is a very special event. Yes. Christmas Eve is a big deal. Mm -hmm. What if the kids do catch the church on fire with the candles? <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, it really is a huge event. But I yeah. just remember uh, that first Christmas Eve going, this is just really cool to be a pastor in this spot. Yeah. But I didn't even think of that when I said, hey, I want to be a pastor. It was like, oh, yeah, and Easter, too. I mean, you're always working, you know, <laughs> um, when other people aren't. But it just, it does. Christmas, I'm, like, I'm with you in the candlelight service. And mm -hmm. 
um, that's been amplified with Matthew in the last few years too. Mm -hmm. So now yeah. we're forming all kinds of traditions around him and what that looks like. And the poor kid's an only kid, so he gets the full dose That's of right. the holiday season. You know, the whole Santa setup is his, the whole, you know, like, <laughs> he gets, <laughs> talk about spoiled, like, you know, the whole, whatever, whatever, he gets home Christmas morning, everything is his, you know what I mean? There's, there's no competition, you know, wherever we're going, that's for him. But then he also gets all the picture opportunities, like Charlotte's like, let's take another picture. He has no chance, you know, he is the sole object of all the pictures and everything. Mm -hmm. Um, but yeah, these special, this, all the holidays, but Christmas itself has a whole nother weight when you're wearing Thank the robe, you. so mm -hmm. to speak. It's it really, really interesting. I didn't anticipate that when I signed up. Um, all right, we are going to our passage for tonight is Philippians chapter 2, verses 1 through 11. I'm going to read those, and then we'll talk about it. If there is any encouragement in Christ... Any consolation from love, any sharing in the Spirit, any compassion and sympathy, make my joy complete. Be of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and in one mind. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility regard others as better than, our, better than yourselves. Let each of you look not to your own interests, but to the interests of others. Let the same mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not regard equality with God as something to be exploited, but emptied himself, taking the form of a slave. Being born in human likeness and being found in human form, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross." Therefore, God also highly exalted him and gave him the name that is above every name, so that the, at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. Fairly famous passage. If you've been in church at all, at some point you've heard 5 through 11, probably. Um, before we get into that, how is the birth of Jesus, or maybe it's coming from this context too, because again, this is not a traditional Christmas passage necessarily, mm -hmm. but how is the birth of Jesus that we anticipate in Advent an act of love? How is the arrival of Jesus, the birth of Jesus, an act of love? Well, he was born to take away our sins. Mm -hmm. God showing his love to us. Mm -hmm. His willingness to be identified with us, mm -hmm. to become human. Yep. Equality with God, not mm -hmm. something to be grasped. Mm -hmm. I don't think we think about, we always think, okay, baby Jesus, mm -hmm. it's all cool, it's Christmas time. <laughs> What's the race in the movie? <laughs> it's, it's baby Jesus. <laughs> um, we think about Jesus and, and it's all happy and it's joy and all this stuff, but, and that's true. But yeah, he's a, it's an act of love that he would even come just to be on earth with us, right? Did not consider equality to be something to be grasped, but instead became one of us. Mm -hmm. That's what the passage talks about. Didn't have to, which is part of what makes it an act of love. He did. He came to be with us, but he didn't have to. Well, not really. They could, God could have just said, yeah, I'm starting over. But God had a different plan. What does Paul mean by consolation from love in verse 1. If there is any, if there's any encouragement in Christ, any consolation from love, what do you think he means by that? Comfort. I have a different um, translation. So. <laughs> He's like, it means comfort. <laughs> That's right. So what does he mean by that? <laughs> if there's any comfort from love, what does that mean? What's that phrase mean? I think it must mean that there's been an encounter. You know, we're, uh, we're obviously talking in terms of the love of God. Mm -hmm. We're in Bible study, it must be Jesus. That's right, Jesus is always <laughs> um, the same answer. Yeah, but you know, if, if you ever experience love in any form, but especially the truest form, the love of God, um, there is just a, a comfort and a peace and a belonging and a sense of 
nobody, I'm not forgotten. Mm -hmm. um, you remembered me. You look past my failings. Mm -hmm. So there, you know, and he says, if any comfort, mm -hmm. not just if you've been completely comforted and all your screwiness is gone, but if you have any comfort, I think that's pretty cool. Mm -hmm. yeah. So yeah, so he says, if, you've got any, if you're getting any encouragement for being in a relationship with God, any comfort from love, he's talking about God's love, obviously, mm -hmm. right? Not just comfort from love for other believers. If you have any comfort or consolation from being loved by God, then he gets into the command side of this. But So he's throwing out these phrases. Um, if you have any encouragement in Christ, consolation from love, sharing in the Spirit, compassion and sympathy, then he gets into verse 2. We'll get that in a minute. So he throws these little phrases out there. If you've got any of this stuff, then you ought to. That's where he's headed. Right? In other words, if you have any connection to God whatsoever, mm -hmm. any inkling of what he has done for you, then Paul says, then make my joy complete. <laughs> so he's like, hey, you're in. If, you, if, this, if you've experienced any of this, then this is the expectation that comes mm -hmm. from, from being that way. And so one, you know, we, we, I've kind of loosely called the series The Promises of Christmas. Mm -hmm. We talked last week that even the arrival of Jesus on earth is a promise of hope because he's going to, we hope he's going to return one day and that's where our hope is found, mm -hmm. right? And this week we're kind of focused on the fact that the fact that he even came in the first place was an act of love. Okay. And in this case, it's, I mean, this is how he's displaying it. He's pursuing us. I was telling somebody the other day, but that's one of the things that distinguishes our faith from others is that God pursues us. Mm -hmm. Every other religion, and, you, and I know you know this, every other religion is our effort to get to God. Mm -hmm. Do this, do this, do this, and he might not crush you. It's only in Christianity where God becomes one of us and chases after us. Hmm. You know? And it's a distinctive. Everybody, nobody, nobody realizes that because we're always focused on making God happy and doing what we're supposed to. But that's not how you find salvation in Christianity. Yeah. Mm -hmm by what you do or whether you go to church or none of that. That's not where you get your salvation from. God pursued us. The, the, the other non christmas verse could be, for God so loved the world, <laughs> right? What's that one? <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah. I'm Tim laughs> Tebow. Yeah. Um, John 3, 16, right? For yeah. God so loved the world that he sent his only son, that whoever believes in him will have eternal life. So he, he loved the world so much he sent Jesus. And then Paul... Paul's recording of this passage is, when we get to this in verse 5, he's echoing John 3, 16, right? Mm -hmm. But it's in diff the difference between John and here is it talks about Jesus not considering his status in heaven something to be held on to. Mm -hmm. You know, in John 3, 16, God sends his son. Okay, Jesus, get in the game, you know? Mm -hmm. um, in Philippians, Jesus didn't consider where he was something to be held on to. Mm -hmm. So you get his willful desire to become one of us in the passage. Um, so, verse 2, he says, make my joy complete. He's talking about his own joy at this mm -hmm. point. He's talking about Paul. Um, be of the same mind, the same love, being in full accord in one mind. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit. But in humility, regard others as better than yourself. So good Paul says, if you love Jesus, do this. <laughs> it should come out of who you are. Let each of you look not to your own interests, but to the interests of others. Let you have, this is, my, this is the key verse right here. Let the same mind be in you that was in Christ. What is the mindset Paul's talking about? And you, it's really five through eight, but I just read five when he's talking about, he refers to the mindset. So. What mindset does Paul want us to have? He wants us to be compassionate of others and, you know. And how is that expressed? Follow the Ten Commandments. <laughs> the Ten Commandments. Keep yeah. all the rules. Absolutely. There's a set of rules that you need to follow. Yeah. <laughs> Jesus did say, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. Mm -hmm. That's absolutely right. Right, <laughs> right. <laughs> It goes back to that first verse. Yeah. So those four things that kind of mm -hmm. he lays out, mm -hmm. these four things I've shown you, if you felt it, mm -hmm. you mirror that to people that you're around. So if you've been encouraged, 
encourage people, if you've had sympathy towards yourself, show sympathy. So mm -hmm. it takes those four things that he lays out and just, that's, good. that's it. You know, I was, I was thinking about this some this morning when I was working on something else. When we try to be a, a better Christian, for lack of a better way of putting it, we're always worried about what we're not doing wrong, right? I don't want to sin. I don't want to do this. I don't want to fall back into this temptation. Mm -hmm. And preachers talk about it. Don't do this. You know, <laughs> keep the Ten Commandments. Don't lie. Right. Don't, I mean, how are the Ten Commandments phrased, right? Don't lie. Don't steal. Thou shalt not. <laughs> yeah. Thou shalt not, right? <laughs> and so we spend most of our Christian faith trying not to do bad. Mm -hmm. But what I've noticed, what's popped into my head or popped, come to my awareness lately when I read Paul is Paul's always talking about what you should be doing. Yeah. Not what you should be avoiding, mm -hmm. but it's the stuff you just said. Instead of worrying about, did I screw up again today? Show compassion, show love. That's the, the frame that Paul comes from is, if you'll live this way, if you'll orient your life this way and focus on this, <clears throat> He doesn't get into the do nots as much. Right. At least in this, he does have some do not passages. I shouldn't say sure. that. But, but his attitude seems to be, it's, it's reflected when he says, put off the old self, put on the new. We spend 95% of our time putting off the old putting self. Off the old. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And Avoiding we, the old. And we forget about the putting on the new part mm -hmm. of that. Well, I gave up, whatever. Good for you. What are you doing now? I don't know. <laughs> I love the whole concept here of back to where we began. If there's any encouragement, any mm -hmm. consolation, any sharing in the spirit, any compassion and sympathy, it's like he says there is there's this well mm -hmm. of goodness coming from God. And if you've experienced any of that, right. you've got something to draw from. Mm -hmm. You're not having to work it up in order to do the right thing. And a friend of mine, um, <laughs> Bill Buckley, who used to be the chaplain of the football team at MSU, um, Bill recently wrote a, a devotional where he talked about how God is simply crazy about us. And uh, it's not really that funny. <laughs> Lisa's phone went off, television audience. Um, <laughs> but uh, God is just crazy about us. And if we have experienced any inkling of that, if we've even caught a glimpse of how much God loves us, then we've got that well. We, we know there's a source. And we don't have to manufacture all of this ourselves. It's there for us. And that's just so encouraging when we think about becoming like Christ. Because we could, we could turn these things into a burden of commandments. Yeah. Instead of living out of the well that he's given us. And what are the two greatest commandments? Love God, love people. Yeah. yeah. The rest will take care of itself. That's mm -hmm. literally what Jesus says. Mm -hmm. yeah, the whole yeah. law hangs on those two commandments. Yeah. And again, those are positive things to focus on mm -hmm. and do versus stay away from. Mm -hmm. And it's important to avoid sin. I'm not minimizing that. But if you spend all of your time avoiding sin, you'll be exhausted, first of all. Because yeah. temptation is always going to come back. Mm -hmm. But if you're like, your mind, this is where Paul comes in at verse 5. He says, have this mindset, right? Orient your life this direction, not that direction. Yeah. Like, where am I moving towards? In this later in Philippians, he talks about pressing on towards the goal mm -hmm. and finishing the race. He throws his athletic metaphors in there. Like, stop looking at where you came from and start focusing on where you're heading and the goal that you're heading to. And the goal is to have the same mindset as Christ Jesus. And then he kind of, he elaborates on what that mindset is. You guys are right to draw back on those, but going forward, he says, who... Though in the very form of God, did not regard equality with God something to be exploited, but emptied himself, taking on the form of a slave, being born in human likeness, and being found in human form, he humbled himself and became obedient even until the point of death. And so the mindset he's referring to there is sacrificial. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Willing to give up anything and everything for the sake of others. And it goes back to being compassionate and all the things that we're talking about. So the orientation of our life is to be that. If Jesus didn't even hang on to that, what are we hanging on to? What part of our old self are we still clinging to? 
-hmm. He goes, have Jesus' mindset, give up all of it. Consider it nothing in comparison mm -hmm. to following Christ. Mm -hmm. And you're right, when you talk, I want to go back to what you said about the, the touch of it. Mm -hmm. The implication is there, there's more to be experienced. Yeah. That we sell ourselves short by just like, okay, I got my fire insurance. Now I got to try to be a good person and not sin. Mm -hmm. But if we're focused on the two most important mm -hmm. commandments, the rest of it takes care of itself. So how do we start to cultivate that mindset? I mean, this is an Advent series, right? And so we're talking about God's love. And so we're talking about how God's love is communicated through the arrival of Jesus, right? So he says, therefore, if there's any encouragement in knowing Christ, any compassion, comfort from having that hope that comes. In other words, when we experience it, this is kind of what you were saying, when we experience it, of course we're going to want to do this. Mm -hmm. It goes from, it, it ought to transfer from duty to desire. Mm -hmm. Now, at first, sometimes we do stuff because, oh, they told me to come to church. That's what I'm supposed to do is go to church. <laughs> but if we tap into that well at all, we'll want to transfer it. Yeah. Uh, let's see. Oh, missed my answer. Oh, sometimes I ask questions, but this should work anyway. <clears throat> Why? This will get, let's get theological for a minute. We were doing an application. Let's get a little theological for a second. Why do you think God had to send his son, Jesus? Why did God have to send Jesus? Why did he do it that way? There's probably several answers to that. <laughs> there might be. But I'm he, not looking for a particular he, one. He had to out. have a perfect sacrifice. Mm -hmm. We know mm -hmm. that. It had to be a sacrifice without spot or blemish. And mm -hmm. Jesus is the only one without sin. Mm -hmm. um, he had to identify with us. The incarnation. There you go. Um, but Jesus had to humble himself so much, mm -hmm. basically, to come down to our level, if you will. Mm -hmm. You know, and that just always gets me. You know, mm -hmm. he had to humble himself, and he was willing to give his own life. You know, to forgive our sins, to make us be better people, and you know, it's just very humbling to me. Mm -hmm. You know, to think of someone that would be willing to give their own life for us, you know. Mm -hmm. To give up what he gave up mm -hmm. to be one of us. Mm -hmm. Right. We always say being us is the best possible thing. He gave up way more than being one of us to be one of us. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> to go through what we go through to stub his toe, to get sick, to deal with what we deal with. Instead of being in heaven going, this is cool. <laughs> <laughs> this, is, this is what Hebrews 2.17 says about my question. Therefore, he, asked, he, asked, he had to become like his brothers and sisters in every respect, so that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in service of God, to make a sacrifice of atonement for the sins of the people. That really is kind of the answer to my question. He had to become one of us that he might be able to be a faithful high priest. Mm. That's an interesting image, right? Because he's not, he doesn't walk around, he doesn't do the high priest thing really. And mm -hmm. I guess he does a little bit in the gospels. But what do you think, they, what do you think the writer of Hebrews is trying to say? He had to become one of us to be a faithful high priest. What does a priest do? I know we're Methodists, but what does a priest do? <laughs> <laughs> but one, he was like on the same level with God, though. I mean, yeah. you know, um, <clears throat> Jesus was and, and just, I don't know. In terms of the Old Testament, a priest was the one that was an intermediary mm -hmm. between God and man. The priest mm -hmm. offered sacrifices for, on behalf of the people. Mm -hmm. um, uh, the priest conveyed all of the sin onto the scapegoat, and the mm -hmm. priest poured the blood out uh, on the altar mm -hmm. so that we could be um, cleansed. And we don't, you know, even in the Catholic Church, we don't really have a, a they call theirs priests, mm -hmm. but we don't really have a 
person that would fulfill the role the way Old Testament priests did. Mm -hmm. um, we've got leaders and teachers, and but it's really unusual to see somebody that um, lives their life in that kind of interme intermediary sacrifici sacrificial way except in extraordinary circumstances. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. I think that's what you're talking about tonight, yeah, becoming I mean, the people that do that. Yeah, <laughs> he, had, he had to become one of us so that he could communicate who we are to God. I mean, it's the, he's, yeah. he's the connecting relationship, right? Mm -hmm. um, he doesn't become a person. We can't know him. Yeah, I mean, I must to take her analogy a little bit further. Before Jesus, you have a priest that is your connection to God. Mm -hmm. After Jesus, the Holy Spirit comes down and that becomes the perfect connection to God mm -hmm. so that I don't have to go talk Ooh. to a priest at the Holy of Holies. Yeah. I always have that connection. Jesus literally becomes the high priest, the holy priest. And so you're exactly right. So he, he, we forget because Jesus left, he's not here, that he's still Jesus. <laughs> I know that sounds weird and simple, but like, Jesus is still Jesus. Yeah. And so in this passage, he's talking about Jesus talking to God on our behalf. Mm. And he's able to do it because he became one of us. There's another place in Hebrews where he talks about him suffering the same temptations we suffer and going through all of the experiences that we go through so that he can relate to us, but so that he can help us relate to God. Mm -hmm. And I said earlier about Christianity being the one that comes to us versus us go to him. Mm -hmm. He became one of us so that we could know him. Mm -hmm. Jesus said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. So he's like, hey, I am the way, the truth, and the life. This is how you know God is through me. Hey, God, this is what their experience is like. Here's how I'm interceding for them. I mean, it's that, he's that in-between person. It's why we don't need a priest anymore. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. In that mm -hmm. sense, right? Because you've got, I mean, there's somewhere else in Romans, Holy Spirit prays when we don't know how to pray. Prays for you. Mm. Jesus is talking to the Father on your behalf, making the sacrifices on our behalf. Mm -hmm. well, and kind of connect the multiple analogies we made so far. Yeah. You have priest and sacrifice before Jesus. Both were not perfect. Mm -hmm. Whether it was a sheep or a lamb, mm -hmm. they weren't perfect. The priest... They were humans. They weren't perfect. That's right. So Jesus is perfect in both ways, whether it's the sacrifice and the priest. That he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in service of God to make a sacrifice of atonement for the sins of the people. Because I'll read the next verse. Because he himself was tested by what he suffered. He is able to help those who are being tested. Mm. So because he experienced us he's able to help us handle those experiences this is not a god that's somewhere else or far off that you hope hears your prayer and like oh, i said a prayer last week i don't know if god heard me like mm -hmm. he's not some distant thing, being yeah he became one of us and knows our experience and knows us and because he knows our experience, he can help walk us through those experiences. That's a God who's right here. Or right here. I mean, that's a God that is with you yeah. Yeah. all the time. Think about the way we talk about God sometimes. I was at this thing, and it was awesome, and the music was great, and God showed up. We use those <laughs> phrases, yeah. right? We, yeah. The church was awesome. The Holy Spirit really just showed up, maybe. Or... Was he there? And we just suddenly realized it. <laughs> and it's, it's not like God's going, please, if you'll say this just right, maybe I'll come down. He's here. It's just whether or not we're like aware <laughs> of him yeah. being here. You know, we, we assume it's like he's over there. I got to take care of this for him. Yeah. He's like, I got this. I'm your high priest. I'm your intermediary. I'm the one that's with you. I've experienced what you're experiencing. I know what it feels like. That's a God who's close, not a God that's somewhere else. That we have to like bring in just the right amount of light and bring the music in just right and turn on the fog machine and then God will show up. God's already there. 
<laughs> Nothing wrong with those things. I'm just saying. Sometimes yeah. we think if we do everything in a certain way and manipulate, like we can <laughs> manipulate God into being specially present somehow. He's looking for the opportunity to be at work in us. We've, I've got a friend um, from Pennsylvania who was talking about that very thing one time. And he says, we try to create all of that mm -hmm. so that people can experience God. And he said, compared to what God already is and who God wants to reveal himself to be in our lives continually, it's like we're set, trying to pull a little trigger on a pop gun and he's a nuclear bomb, yeah. you know? <laughs> so we get this little flag that come out, comes out that says, bam, on Sunday morning. And God is, Introducing the, the dunamis, the Holy Spirit, the dynamite of God. Mm -hmm. yeah. As soon as you think God fits into your little experience on Sunday morning, or you try to fit God into your little experience on Sunday morning, you've already limited the consolation from love and everything yeah. we were reading earlier. That little well you're talking about again, mm -hmm. you're squeezing it into this little worship service when God's much bigger than that. Yeah. Um, and he's not somewhere else. He's already there. We just got to go, oh, there He you just are. wants us to love him. Yeah. You know, the, it's just, it sounds so simple. He just wants us to love him and, you know, try to be better and live a certain way. But it just sounds so simple. Well, I think we make you it know? harder than it has to be. Yeah, I agree. And simple is not always easy. There's a difference. So mm -hmm. simple is straightforward and clear. Mm -hmm. Easy is easy. And there's a distinction. This can, something can be extremely simple and not be easy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Hitting a baseball is as much as a matter of swinging a bat. It's simple. It's not easy. <laughs> <laughs> it's real simple. Right. Stand up there and hit it. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's simple. I got this. People get paid some millions of dollars trying to hit that sucker. It's not easy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know what I mean? And so we do that with religion sometimes. It is simple. Yeah. Love God, love others. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Everything else is stuff we've piled on top of it to make it more complicated because it feels too simple. Yeah. And it's not easy either. No, and it's not easy. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> loving God and loving others sometimes yeah, the is second extremely one's the one complicated. That get. <laughs> loving God, oh, he's perfect. I got this. Loving others, ew. <laughs> um, except sometimes God, but God says, when you love others, you love me. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, but yeah, it's simple. Love others. Okay. You know? <laughs> so what does that entail? <laughs> it's simple, but, but see, here's the thing. That's just it, right? It's, the, it's the original passage we're talking about. The simple thing is, I've got to go be one of them. Mm. But it would, had, could not have been easy to give up everything to become one of us. Mm -mm. And so when Paul says, have the same mindset as Christ, is real simple. Be willing to sacrifice yourself for others. But it's not easy. But that's what he's saying. Emulate Christ. If you've, got any, if you've gained anything from your relationship with God, any inclination, tiniest bit, piece of the well, then pour yourself out for everybody else the same way Jesus poured himself out for you. Simple. But we make it follow this rule, do this. Uh, dude, God has already told us how to love other people. Mm -hmm. We just don't, we, I don't want to do it that way. I want to do it the way it's easy. Sending a check is easy. Getting dirty with them, not so much. <laughs> yeah. You know? Yeah. I mean, that's, that's one of the challenges of missions, right? Oh, I'll send you a check. No, 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 no. I need you to come feed these people face to face. Yeah. Uh, you I was to do talking with, with somebody recently about a, a need, you know, and this person wanted to help meet the need, but said, I can't do this indefinitely. And I, it just really struck me. And I said, well, well that's exactly how long you can do it. <laughs> indefinitely. We're signing you up for life. <laughs> <laughs> indefinitely does not mean eternally. It just means until God says stop. We don't know how long that is. Oh, that's yeah. good. You yeah. know, it, it, indefinitely is exactly how long he's called us to love mm -hmm. in, in each per and forgive 70 yeah. times seven right yeah. yeah yeah i think i think i think we do that i think it's one of our i know i struggle with this i'll just own it because of such circumstances are a certain way mm -hmm. our default is it'll always be this way and that's what raises our stress level mm -hmm. you know um i don't want to wear a mask 
<laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. But it's going to be like that for, it's going to be like this forever. At least that's how it feels. Mm -hmm. But nobody's asking you to do it forever. You know, we're asking you to do it until whatever is safe not to, you know, indefinitely. Yeah, <laughs> that's right. But I mean, we think our current, when we're going through something difficult, we go through a loss of a loved one and we're mm -hmm. hurting. Mm -hmm. Our default is it's always going to be like that. That's kind of the mindset that gets in. This pain's never going to go away. But that's not true. No, it's not. But when we're experiencing, and there's probably a part, and, and I know this is close to your heart, right? But there's always this some part of you that's gone. I get that. Mm -hmm. But we think wherever we're, fr we're frozen in time when we have a particular experience and we're going through it, we're not mm -hmm. stuck there. Right? Exactly. You move on. You have to. Yeah. You have to live. Because yeah. the intensity does fade. You may always miss or hurt, but the intensity oh, yeah. does go away. But when you're in the middle of that intensity, you think, this is how it's going to be. I lose hope. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? When you're hurting that much, you know, oh, yeah. you think, oh, this, I'm not living like this. Mm -hmm. That's where people get that way, especially at the holidays, mm -hmm. right? And so you go, but this is not the way it's frozen. It's a process you're going through. And God's with you in it, and the church is with you in it, and it's going to change eventually. Mm -hmm. But it's hard to see that sometimes we're in the middle of it. It is. And especially this year. It's been such an unusual year, mm -hmm. and people are so isolated and alone. Mm -hmm. And uh, older people being shut away in senior living centers, and mm -hmm. just when they think the doors are going to be open, they get shut down again. And, yeah. um, people not able to gather together to mourn the losses in their lives. Um, it's been a tough year, and it's a year, you say the church is going to be there with you, but it's been a year where for some people, it's been hard to tap into the church. Sure. Because yeah. for, what, six months we weren't together at all, mm -hmm. or four. Um, it's been a tough year to really... The pastor side that. of that is like, and I'm sure the longing is in both directions, but it's like, I want to be there for you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, God will let me know. And I don't know how, because yeah. I'm not allowed to be there yeah. for you. Yeah. yeah. I mean, that's been one, for the last few months, that's been one of the biggest challenges for me, especially moving to a new community. You go, hi, I'd like to come pastor you. I'm not allowed to. You know? Yeah. yeah. So what do I do? <laughs> what do I do all day and get paid? You know, like, <laughs> hi. <laughs> you know? Uh, my default would be to have this big party at my house and get to know you, but I can't do that. You know, like... But you have to remember, though, the, the sermons and the music and everything is taped, and it's not the same watching it on TV, no. but it is there. Right. You know, it is still comforting, and it is still there, and hopefully people will remember that. Mm -hmm. You know, even though there's not many of us here, we're still worshiping, we're still singing, we're still praising on Sunday, and you just need to make the effort. It's, it's you know. just a really, it's a really, you know, hey, I'm your pastor. I've never met you. <laughs> <laughs> Let me tell you how to live. <laughs> it's just a weird year. <laughs> yeah, it is. It's really strange. So in verses 5 through 8, Paul goes into explicit detail about Jesus' attitude. Not giving up, giving up equality with God, humbling himself. This translation this says literally becoming a slave. Is it you slave and yours? I don't know. Mm -hmm. And so it's this, the attitude of Christ that Paul's referring to is this sacrificial attitude. That's what he's driving at. Mm -hmm. Being willing to give up anything. Like he gave, he gave heaven, you can give up whatever you got going on to be available to other people, to help other people. How do you think that those verses shape you, especially during Advent? We're in the Christmas season. Paul says, have the mindset of Christ. Be willing to give up anything to humble yourself. How does that shape us, especially at Advent season? Um, can, I, can I say one thing before we answer that question? Sure. Um, in Acts chapter 2, G Peter's m preaching the sermon, and he says, re focusing on what was still ahead, he gave himself up on the cross. And I think that helps us. If we have a view to eternity, if, we, if our mindset is the same as Christ, mm -hmm. he knew heaven was there. He knew eternity was there. He knew that the, the time of sacrifice was not eternal, um, but that eternity with God was, the relationship with God was eternal. 
And so that's, that helps us, I think, to be able then. Ties into what we're saying about being temporary, right? Yeah. He knew yeah. it was, he knew he had to go through it, but yeah. it wasn't permanent. Right, yeah. He already had a plan to return, yeah. <laughs> so to speak. Sure. And then your question was, how do we express this at Christmas? Yeah. I, I was thinking, I've been thinking while we've been talking about this, um, we have friends in Missouri who, when their girls were growing up, every Christmas they would practice the 12 days of Christmas. And each day they would prepare a surprise for somebody in their community. And man, this would really work this year yeah. with COVID lockdowns. Mm -hmm. And they would take it and the girls would take it up to the doorbell and ring the doorbell and run off. And it might be for a woman that loves to cook, it might be you know a new wooden spoon and a dish towel that had Christmas decorations on it or something. And for somebody that loved chocolate, it might be Reese's Cups and M&Ms or, mm -hmm. you know, and, and, and specific to the people that they were ministering to. And so that's, that's one way to do it, to really think about how we can touch um, in a time when it's hard to be together. I don't, is that kind of what you were talking sure. about? Sure, absolutely. And you gave me a nice segue to the next part of this too. Oh, okay, sorry. No, 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 I'm saying that was good. You set me up. Okay. Good. Yeah. <laughs> I love it when a plan comes together. <laughs> How does it shape you to have the mindset of Christ at Advent? What does that look like? It could be something like what you're talking about. Okay. Absolutely. Okay. How does it shape you? I'm just grateful for what I have. Okay. You know, and, and I've been able to go through a lot of troubling things, but I'm grateful for what I have. I'm grateful that I have a son and, um, you know, I think we all just need to sometimes sit down and see what we do have instead of thinking of what we don't. Mm -hmm. We need to just say, hey, look what, look what all these things I have. I've had this great church, these great friends, you know, I've got family and we just need to Stop and think about that, I think, every once in a while. Yeah, Jesus looks around at heaven and goes, I've got lots of stuff here. This is awesome. <laughs> <laughs> but it won't be here forever. But I'm going to let go of it so I can go love them. Yeah. <laughs> but you're right. You're absolutely right. I, I, I think even, even if we give up stuff or if we're willing to give up something, you have to know what you're, you have to appreciate what you have to give up first. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, appreciation, especially at the holidays. And at the holidays, oh, you yeah. always think about it, right? I got to get so and so, and <laughs> <laughs> your gift list. If you haven't done your shopping yet, you know, like, what am I going to do? <laughs> what am I willing? How much am I willing to give up? <laughs> yeah, <right. laughs> how much am I willing to spend on this person? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but really like them that much. <laughs> oh, they're on the naughty list this year. I'm not giving much. Matthew's asking me. Am I on the naughty list or the good list? I don't know. What do you think, Stephanie? Oh. <laughs> what do you think I need to get on the good list? I'll tell Santa for you. Yeah. <laughs> How does having the mind of Christ shape us? Yeah. Um, a willingness to sacrifice. Yeah. How does that play out at Advent? I think you gave a great example, by the way. Yeah. Twelve days of surprises is pretty cool. Yeah. I think that's it. I mean, I, I know for me, I know at Christmas, everybody gets generous. Mm -hmm. I mean, by yeah. default, it's the generous season, right? Like, I'm going to give, I was joking about giving stuff, by just gifts or whatever, but mm -hmm. that's what we do. It's like, my dad, my dad used to like, my mom and dad would work out all the Christmas plans for gifts or whatever. And then my dad, when I was growing up, was notorious for disappearing at Christmas Eve and coming back with like something that costs as much <laughs> as the rest of the budget. Oh. You know, like it was budget. Yeah, Here was the Christmas giving budget. Early. Yeah. Here was the grip. Well, he would just he it, it was it's just kind of the way he is. Like, here's the Christmas budget. This is how much we can spend on the kids or whatever. And then he'd go out at Christmas Eve without her consent and just blow that. <laughs> <laughs> <You know? Yeah. laughs> and do something really cool for the family or for some, you know like or just go get all of us something else extravagant or whatever and just completely blow any kind of limitation uh -huh. ceiling <laughs> on that deal and we always like sweet where's the big gift you know? <laughs> um, my my dad and his sister um jean for christmas give one another and they do for their, their spouses too they give one another um 
gifts to other ministries. So that's one way that they play it out. They all admit, which I'm learning right now, um, that I don't need any more stuff. And yeah. if I need it or want it, I'm probably going to just go right out and get it. Mm -hmm. And But what they do is, for instance, buy a cow for the heifer project, you know, and that goes to a farmer in mm -hmm. a two-thirds world country, or they'll um, help build a church in Nigeria or something like that. So they're in the name of the person that the gift is for or is made in honor of. And so that's one way that they're doing it instead of just giving stuff. stuff yeah. And I thought this year, um, finances have been a little tighter this year. So I think for some of my gifts, there's going to be a lot more homemade stuff. But I'm going to take time to write that letter and say those things in a letter written down that I say from time to time, but I want them to see it and know. And do that for, don't, y'all don't, in my family, just turn this off now. Um, do it for the ones I like. No, I say that. <laughs> but take time to really write down for them those promises that might stay with them, the promises of my love my mm -hmm. appreciation for what they've done for me and I think one of the most precious things is to give people your undivided attention yeah. your time. Mm -hmm. just like when your kids are growing up you know you, you give them your time and mm -hmm. and they don't forget that they they remember all the things that you did and and it doesn't have to cost much just you know a kind word or just a few minutes of your attention mm -hmm. is enough mm -hmm. you know instead of stuff that's right yeah, I was, my dad's his tradition. What I've noticed is I've I've picked up that tradition. <laughs> I mean, Matthew's an only kid, so it's not that hard to like. I'm just gonna go out and get him something else. Yeah, yeah that's why I'm saying I can't my, start too my early because I'll just start over. Again. I have I have a brother and a sister, so he's having to do that for three kids. I just got Matthew. It's like <laughs> yeah, Matthew needs one more nerf. Wasn't <laughs> <laughs> in the budget, you know, whatever. Just mm -hmm. feel like going and doing that. The tradition lives on, kind of thing. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, so yeah, so this idea of Christmas is all about a lot for a lot of us by default. Sometimes is what am I getting for Christmas? Yeah, you know, the teaching of Philippians too is what am I willing to give up for the sake of others? And so it's kind of the sport, the foil to the Christmas. What am I getting? Attitude. You know what I mean? It's like. Oh, what am I giving, not what am I getting? Considering what I've got, nothing to be held on to, I might as well go the extra mile on Christmas Eve and go crazy. <laughs> you know? <laughs> I mean, you know, I'm just using that as an example, but like putting the needs of others first. Now, this is for Advent. We're talking about this in the context of Advent, but this is the very pastor part of me, but why is not Advent 12 months a year? That's right. And by that, I mean, have it called, Paul doesn't go at Christmas time have the mindset of Christ mm -hmm. and consider nothing worth being held on to but empty yourself mm -hmm. that's not what he says he says if you have any comfort or consolation in a relationship with Jesus then do this yeah. he didn't qualify it with a season of the year and we, we highlight it in Advent because everybody gets in the generous spirit and the Christmas spirit because they know they're getting some stuff in return. You know? <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, what if the whole year we listen to what Paul has to say about this? And the stuff that we have and the stuff that we, we don't hang on to that. And it doesn't even have to be about stuff. What he gave up was his status. Mm -hmm. His equality with God, mm -hmm. but the, he empt, it says he emptied himself, mm -hmm. and, and we don't even grasp what that means. For him to be one of the persons of the Trinity, in heaven, out of the way, away from the presence of sin, with the angels, and here in the glory of the saints, and all that stuff, he gives all of that, uh, that status up, and becomes a baby in a manger. And we're like, yeah, I don't think I can get out for Christmas Eve service. I mean, you know, like... <laughs> <laughs> What are we talking about here? You know what I mean? Or it's only for the month of December and then I'm going back to my, my own consuming self. You know, like, <laughs> what? How do we not, I mean, the whole idea of Advent ought to, sh I've asked the question kind of in a loaded way. How does it shape us at Advent, right? Mm -hmm. it, Philippians 2 ought to shape our whole spiritual journey, not just at Advent. 
when we realize, you're talking about appreciate, when we realize what Christ gave up for mm -hmm. us, we're supposed to have the same willingness to give up anything to you. And that's supposed to shape our faith walk. In fact, the, the love that comes through the promise of Christmas is this. This is what God did for us. Are we willing to carry it forward to others? If we've had any comfort, any consolation, any inkling of what God's love is, of course we ought to want to pass it on. It's not passive. You know, like, there's this whole, like, if we really do, and sometimes people, frankly, struggle whether they do or not, but if we really experience God's love, we can't help but pass it on. Because when you do reflect and go, he did, this, is, this passage is one of my favorites, because I go, he did what for me? Yeah. <laughs> when I visit this passage, that, I go, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped. And I'm not willing to give up what? It's humbling to read that, you know? And so that becomes a, a gaining that mindset is an attitude of being willing to hold everything at arm's length that you have. But not just money, not just possessions, not mm -hmm. just stuff, me. My willingness to be with some, to empty myself in the sense of willing to sacrifice and be with somebody I may not want to be with or help or whatever. Right. It's a, will, it's a mindset. It's a heart orientation mm -hmm. that says, I'm not hanging on to anything. And we lose sight of that outside of the December window. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know? I, was just, I was thinking about that as sitting here. Um, when I was a little girl, one of our favorite things to do, and I thought, always thought it was really cool, was to get a jar and you decorate the jar for Christmas. And then inside the jar for your mother, since you didn't have much money as a little girl, inside it, it would say, every month you get to pull out one sheet of paper and it would say, I'll wash the dishes for a week. Mm -hmm. And that would be your gift yeah. for the week. Or I'll, um, I'll clean the toilets or I'll babysit the little boys or you know whatever it is. And I was just thinking in terms of practicing and becoming a disciple mm -hmm. of, of taking on the mind of Christ and really giving, what if we did something like that in our relationship with God and during Christmas season, sit down and write down 12 things for one, one each month of the year or 52 things, one thing for each week of the year. Um, you know, I'll, I'll go visit a sick friend or I'll, you know, I'll visit that elderly person at church that can't come to church anymore or I'll um, write a letter to someone that's been hurting or, or that I need to ask forgiveness from, whatever it might be. I'll go rake leaves for the shut-in down the street, whatever it might be, just to practice that giving up of self and really make a commitment to do something like that. There's your New Year's resolution for 21, right there. there. Are. Mm -hmm. What's your 12-month activity going to be? What's your 52-week activity going to be? Whew. Yeah, that's a big one. Now, <laughs> what am I going to do with this? There's some homework for you right there. <laughs> um, Sorry. No, no, no. It's good. <laughs> I'm looking and at that. What, what I like is what I like is the idea of practice. Yeah. Because when we're talking about mindset and we're talking about orientation of our heart, it takes practice. Hmm. I threw out the baseball illustration a while ago. It's like it's simple. Hit the ball, but it's not easy. Right. Right. How do you get better hitting the ball? Practice. Practice. Bat, literally batting practice and swinging mm -hmm. over and over and a coach that tells you adjust this part of your swing and oh wait it's a hitting a ball is a discipline in major league baseball i heard they swing before they even see the pitch they mm -hmm. anticipate what the pitch is or they're not going to hit it when it's coming at 99 miles an hour yeah like they just go this has to, i have to swing like this is a curveball and i don't even know if it's a curveball yet like that takes yeah. practice <laughs> and they miss when it's a fastball that's how it works you know like i mean so yeah. The analogy carries, though. If we're going to have the mindset of Christ, to use Philippians 2's language, we've got to practice the mindset of Christ. Mm -hmm. And like, over a, like and a over. baseball player, you develop muscle memory yep. so that without thinking, you yep. don't have yep. to yep. think, okay, I'm yep. going to stand a foot and a half from the plate, or I don't know how far you stand. I'm going to hold the bat here, and <laughs> I'm going to swing through, and I'm not going to drop my shoulder. You know, it eventually becomes muscle memory. And I think as we grow in Christ, setting self aside, denying self, 
and doing for others becomes a spiritual muscle memory. And yeah. it becomes more and more the natural thing. You know, when I was a young Christian, there were lots of things that I needed to give up. I'm sorry, I was a bad person. I still am sometimes, but um, there were things that I had to give up and I had to train my mind not to desire those things. But as I grew in the Lord, mm -hmm. Those things were not so much a problem anymore, and then I could focus on more because I had begin, begun fact focusing on giving away and investing in other people. I could just continue to do that, um, mm -hmm. and it becomes a part of who we are just naturally. I see that, Lisa, in you. I know Lisa better than I know either of these guys because I know <laughs> if I were around you more, but I see that in Lisa. There's just a natural giving from your spirit. Um, and part of that comes from the suffering you've had and mm -hmm. we comfort others with the comfort we've received. But, you know, it becomes more and more natural the more we mm -hmm. practice at it. And that's a, yeah. that's a good thing. Mm -hmm. One thing, especially before COVID, <laughs> I, every time I went out, I made an effort to speak to somebody I did not know. Mm -hmm. And I've been doing that for a long time wow. and it brings me such joy you know, um, it's something so simple, but you never know. You can make somebody's day just by looking them in the face and saying good morning or whatever, you know. And, I, and I've had several people come back to me. Um, there was a gentleman in France one time that I spoke to, and, and he, he came looking for me after he checked out and to tell me how much it meant for me, a stranger, to speak to him. He said, I was having a bad day and you made my day by just speaking to me. Wow. But we can do simple things like that. Yeah. And, and you know, yeah. we just need to, to get in the habit of doing it. Mm -hmm. And that's just some simple something that I, that I try to do. That's really But good. it brings me a lot of joy, mm -hmm. you know? It really does. And when you think of the practice that you're throwing out there, like, what if you did this? Some of us go, that's not me, you know. Like, <laughs> I'm not doing that. I gotta come up with something else. But yeah, the thing you're is, fine. What you're but, made for. But yeah. here's the thing, though. That would be true. Of anything you decide to take on. Yeah. So the practice at first is gonna feel awkward. You're not gonna want to do it. You're not gonna know how to stand and swing. Like, I mean, it's it's weird at first. But what happens is it does get easier and become second nature. The muscle memory does. That's exactly how spiritual discipline is designed to work. Mm -hmm. Is it's if you when you try something new spiritually, it's like. I don't know how to pray in public. Mm -hmm. That's all. It's going to be awkward. But once you've done it, it maybe it still might be awkward, but it's going to be less awkward. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> you no know, I told you, I, <clears throat> you asked me to do this the first time, and I'm yeah. like, no. I don't like the center of attention. I, I'm just, yeah. you know, I, that's not me. And then Zach sat me down. And <laughs> my son said, you ought to at least give it a chance. And, yeah. and I've enjoyed it. I mean, it is something... I've never thought I would do. Never. You know. Now that I know that, Zach has to do the next one. <laughs> That's right. So you can say, son, you need to at least give it a try. I mean, it's coming it's for you, Zach. A, a blessing to me to be able to be part of the group. And it's just, you know, and, and I, I'm like, gosh, I almost missed out on this. You know, but yeah, you were a hard no instantly, and then like I'll do it. After he, I'm, I'm like, no. <laughs> I'm like, okay. I really thought yeah. she would well, do thank this. Thank you for letting me know in such a hurry. Uh, I was like, I really thought she would do it, but I guess not. Yeah. And then she came back later. I'm like, okay, cool. Um, so I mentioned you kind of set me up earlier, so I want to kind of wrap it up this way. Um, you made the comment that like Jesus was able to give up because he could see the other end, yeah. right? Verses 9 through 11. And I lost my spot, so i got to go back to Philippians here. My glasses slid out of the place. General Electric Power Company. Okay, here we go. Galatians, <laughs> Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians. Um, Therefore, God also highly exalted him and gave him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bend in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father. So Paul throws in there, he was obedient. Not just sacrificial, but he obeyed. He obeyed even until death. Therefore, God exalted him. So Paul even gives us in the passage, Jesus did it because he knew what it was going to accomplish. He knew it was temporary. He knew it was necessary because I can't intercede for them and be their high priest unless I go. Mm -hmm. 
Mm. And I, but mm -hmm. why he went was love. He becomes a baby in a manger out of love for us. Mm -hmm. And he loved us so much, he did not consider equality with God something to be grasped. But he was able to because he knew what it was for. And what it was for is the picture of 9 through 11. To be exalted as Lord over all. And he was, but he would be restored. It was not, oh, you're going to be a baby, you're going to die, and that's it. We'd all be lost if that was the case. Mm -hmm. He knew what the end game was. It was to redeem us. And so he could do it because he loved us and wanted to redeem us. That's what I said at the outset. In Christianity, we're pursued by a God who loves us. Who, became, who loved us enough to become one of us so that he would know how to intercede for us. And if we get any consolation from knowing that love and experiencing that love, then we're supposed to pass that love on to everybody else, which is really at the heart of the Advent season mm -hmm. when you think about it. If we focus on the fact he became, he gave up all that, became one of us because he loved us, how can I not be willing to give up part of me or generosity or anything I've got to love other people as well? Because we don't have to give up near what he gave up yeah. by any stretch of the imagination. And so when he does that for us, our automatic response is to love others the same way. I, I joked about the fact that I'm carrying on my dad's tradition, right? Because he went the extra mile on Christmas Eve, now I'm doing it for Matthew. You know what I mean? That's how it transfers. Yeah. Oh, yeah. When we become fully aware of the fact that God loves us, it spills past us to the next person. We go out at Christmas Eve, too, for their sake. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> we carry it forward. Because if we have that, we, we get the mindset from the one who had the mindset. That's why Paul says, be like Jesus, because he's like, Jesus didn't consider heaven worth hanging on to. We didn't give up anything else. Let me pray for you. God, this is the challenge. But it's not really a challenge when we fully grasp how much you love us. When we realize that you loved us this much, it's that much easier for us to display that love too. Because when we experience it, that's the well that we have to go to. Continue to build that faith and discipline in us so that our love for others is second nature. In Christ's name, amen. Amen. Yeah.